1954 AC, the Red Keep was in mourning after the death of Septon Oswick when the next blow fell, though at the time it seemed an occasion for joy. A raven from Storm's End delivered an astonishing message. Queen Alyssa was once again pregnant at the age of 46. It was seen as a miracle, but Septon Barth was more doubtful. Alyssa had never completely recovered from the birth of her son Boromund, and Barth questioned whether she still had the strength to carry the child to term. But nonetheless, Rogar Baratheon was elated at the prospect of another son to follow him, and foresaw no difficulties. On Dragonstone, problems of another sort were coming to a head. Lady Alyssa Farman could not suffer life upon the island anymore. She told Queen Raina she had heard the sea calling her, and it was time for her to leave. Not one to make a show of emotion, Raina received the news stone-faced. She told Alyssa that she would not beg for her to stay, and to go as she pleased. When Lady Alyssa came to say her farewell to Princess Arya, the princess wept and clung to her leg tightly, pleading with her to take her with her. She told Alyssa she wanted nothing more than to sail the seas and have adventures. Lady Alyssa is said to have shed a tear as well, but she pushed the princess away gently and told her her place was at Dragonstone with her mother. Alyssa Farman departed for Driftmark the next morning. From there, she took a ship across the narrow sea to Pentos. Thereafter, she made her way overland to Bravos, whose shipwrights were far famed but Raina Targaryen and Princess Arya had no notion of her final destination. The Queen believed she had gone no further than Driftmark. Lady Alyssa had good reason for wanting more distance between her and the Queen. A fortnight after her departure, the commander of the castle garrison brought three terrified grooms and the keeper of the dragon yard to Raina. Three dragon eggs were missing, and days of searching could not turn them up. After questioning every man who had access to the dragons closely, it was concluded Lady Alyssa had made off with them. If this betrayal by one she had loved wounded Raina Targaryen, she hid it very well. But there was no hiding her fury. She commanded the questioning of the grooms and stable boys more sharply. She even went as far to summon her husband, Andrew Farman, demanding to know if he had been complicit in his sister's crimes. His denials only goaded her more to rage, till her shouts could be heard echoing through the halls of Dragonstone. She sent men to Driftmark, only to learn that Lady Alyssa had sailed to Pentos. She sent men to Pentos, but that's where the trial ran cold. Only then they mount her dragon dream fire to fly to the Red Keep and inform her brother King Jaehaerys what had transpired. She told her brother Alyssa had no love for dragons and it was gold she wanted, gold to build a ship. They came to the conclusion that she would sell the eggs. The eggs are worth a fleet of ships. Jaehaerys received his sister in his solar with only Grand Mace the Benefer. Jaehaerys was rightly worried. He feared that if the eggs should hatch, there would be another dragon lord in the world, not of House Targaryen. Benefer put forward the idea that may not hatch away from Dragonstone without its heat. It is known that some dragonets turn to stone if not properly cared for. Then some spice monger in Pentos will find himself with three very costly stones. Or if they did indeed hatch, the birth of three young dragons is not a thing that can be easily kept a secret. Whoever has them will talk. The king told his sister he would do what he needed to control the situation, but also warned her not to wash her hands of this. She wanted Dragonstone and the king gave it to her and it was hers, and it was her who let Alyssa in the castle. The long reign of Jaehaerys Targaryen was peaceful one for the most part. His wars were few and far between, but Jaehaerys could not be mistaken for his father Aenys. There was nothing weak about him, nothing indecisive, as his sister Raina witnessed that day when the king went on to say that if the dragon should turn up for anywhere from King's Land into Yt, they would demand them back, that they were stolen from House Targaryen, and they are theirs by right, and that if that demand should be denied, they would go and take them. They would get them back if they could, and kill them if not, as no hatchling could hope to stand against Vermithor and Dreamfire. He would not allow Old Valyria to rise again, just imagining what the Triarchs of Atlantis would do if they had access to dragons. On Dragonstone, the thief was common knowledge, even among the fisherfolk, and the fisherfolk, as it is known, sailed to other islands, and thus the whispers spread. Benefer, acting through the Pantashi Master of Coin, who had agents in every port, reached out across the narrow sea, as the king had commanded for any news of dragon eggs, dragons, or Elisa Farman. A small host of whispers, informers, and courtesans produced hundreds of reports, few of which proved to be valued to the Iron Throne for other reasons, but every rumour of dragon eggs proved worthless. We know now that Lady Elisa made her way to Bravos, after Pentos, though not before taking on a new name. Having been driven from Fair Isle and disowned by her brother Lord Franklin, she took on the bastard name of her own devising, calling herself Alice Westhill. Under that name, she secured an audience with the Sea Lord of Bravos. The Sea Lord's wealth was famed, and he gladly bought the Dragon Eggs. The gold she received in return, she entrusted to the Iron Bank, and used it to finance the building of Sun Chaser, the ship she had dreamed of for many years. None of this was known in Westeros at the time. However, soon enough, King Jaehaerys had a fresh concern. In the starry sept of Old Town, the High Septon had collapsed whilst ascending a flight of steps to his bedchamber. 
he was dead before he reached the bottom. All across the realm, bells in every set sang a sombre and dolorous tone. The king had no time for prayer or grieving though. As soon as his high holiness was interned, the most devout would be assembling in the starry set to choose his successor, and Jaehaerys knew that the peace of the realm depended on a new man continuing the policies of his predecessor in his regards to the Targaryens and his marriage to his sister Alysanne. The king had his own candidate, Septon Barth, who had come to oversee the Red Keep's library, only to become one of his most trusted advisors. It took half the night for Barth himself to persuade the king of the folly of his choice, as he was too young and too little known, too unorthodox in his opinions, not even one of the most devout. He had no hope of being chosen. There would need to be another candidate, one more acceptable to his brothers of the faith. The king and his lords of the Sword Council were agreed on one thing, however. They must need do all they could to make certain that Septon Matthias was not chosen. His tenure in King's Landing had left a legacy of mistrust behind it, and Jaehaerys could neither forgive nor forget his words at the gates of Dragonstone many years ago at his marriage to his sister. Rigo Drad suggested some well-placed bribes might produce desired results. Damon Valerian and Carl Corbray advocated a show of force. Albert Massey, the Master of Lords, wondered if Septon Matthias might suffer the same fate as the High Septon made so much trouble for Aeneas and Magor. A sudden death, a mysterious death. Septon Bath, Grand Maester Benefer, and Queen Alysanne were horrified by all these proposals, and the king rejected them all. He and the queen would go to Old Town at once, he decided. His High Holiness had been a leal servant to the gods and a staunch friend to the Iron Throne. It was only right that they be there to lay him to rest. The only way to reach Old Town in time was by dragon. All the laws of the council were made uneasy by the thought of the king and queen alone in Old Town. Lord Damon reminded Jaehaerys of what had happened to the Queen at Maidenpool. When the King insisted that he would have the protection of the Hightowers, uneasy glances were exchanged. The Council viewed Lord Donald Hightower as a schemer and did not trust him. They felt he does what he wants and what he thinks best for himself, his house and Old Town, and cares not for anyone else or anything else, not even for his King. But the King just saw this as a chance to better his relationship with the Wayward Lord. Even for a dragon, the flight from King's Landing to Old Town is a long one. The king and queen stopped twice along the way, once at Bitterbridge and once at Highgarden, resting overnight and taking counsel with their lords. The lords of the council had insisted they take some protection, and Sir Geoffrey Doggart of Lewis of Alisan and the Scarlet Shadow, John Quill Drake, with Jaehaerys. The unexpected arrival of Vermifort and Silverwing at Old Town brought thousands to the streets. No word of their coming had been sent ahead, and there was many in the city who were fearful. None, may perhaps more, than Septon Matthias, who turned power when he was told Jaehaerys had brought the Vermifor down on the wide marble plaza outside the starry set. But it was his queen who made the city gasp when Silverwing alighted atop the high tower itself, the beating of her wings fanning the flames of its famous beacon. Though the High Septon's funeral rites were the reason for their visit, he had already been interred at the crypts beneath the starry set by the time the King and Queen arrived. Jaehaerys gave a eulogy anyway, addressing a huge crowd of Septons, Maesters and small folk in the plaza. He announced that he and his Queen would remain in Old Town until the new High Septon had been chosen, so they might ask for his blessing. As Aunt Maester Goodwin wrote afterwards, small folk cheered, the Maesters nodded sagely, and the Septons looked at one another and thought on the dragons. <laughs>